morning, guys. How's everybody doing? You guys doing well? Awesome. Great to have the choir and orchestra up here. So, uh, I mean, I'm here to have our Cactus Campus joining us now, and all of you in the chapel and in the venue, and all of you at the Shea Worship Center. Uh, welcome from way up north. We appreciate you guys joining us and giving us a chance to uh, bring the word to you live from, from up at your Northridge campus. So it's good to have everybody with us. We're in our third week of this Love One series. If you guys have been around and been tracking with us, uh, Jamie started everything off with this idea of uh, got to be intentional, right? He, he spelled beautifully uh, that everyone matters to God. Everyone is created in the image of God, and so therefore everyone matters to God, uh, and everyone should matter to us. And so we need to be intentional with those that God has put in our world. Uh, and then Rustin came along last week and talked about this idea of we need to be relational inside of that. And especially in our culture today, where maybe relational is not our strong suit, there's great opportunity for us as the church, as the children of God, as the family of God, to step out and be relational and intentional uh, with the people that God has put in our path. And so today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that I hope is very encouraging. Hopefully it's inspiring, uh, but it's an opportunity for us to not just be intentional and relational, but actually put words to our faith and perhaps to present the gospel to those that God has put in our path. And so that's where we're going to go. But before we get there, uh, I want to share a story. Okay, this is a story uh, of a young 17-year-old Kevin Ewell. I was a junior at Horizon High School. And uh, this was back in the day for all of you millennials, just so you can understand this. We didn't have cell phones, uh, but what we did have were pagers. You guys remember pagers? Yes. So we all, all the high schools, like, if you didn't have a pager, you weren't in it, right? So we had a pager. And uh, a page would go out on a Friday night, and it wouldn't be a phone number, but it would be a, a, a specific number. And we had a, a secret code, all of my friends. Uh, different numbers meant meet at different places. So we would, some of the times we would congregate the Jack in the Box at Scottsdale and Thunderbird. Uh, but this particular Friday night, uh, the text went out or the page went out. We all got it. And we were to show up at Sweetwater Park, which is at 56th Street in Sweetwater. And so we begin to congregate in the parking lot of this, this park. And there's maybe 15 or 20 of us. And we're kind of waiting for the rest of our crew to roll up. And all the cars are kind of parked there in a circle. And uh, I'm talking to a couple of my friends over here. And all of a sudden, a car pulls in the parking lot. And it's a car we don't recognize. Pulls right up and gets right into the middle of my circle of friends. And out hop two seniors, two senior boys. Uh, one I had recognized, so I had played football with him earlier that year. Uh, and the other one I knew, he was in my auto shop class when I was a freshman. He was a sophomore. That was about the extent of my knowledge of that guy. But out come these two seniors uh, and amongst my group of, of junior friends. And they're just talking and doing whatever, so I don't pay much attention to them. And I begin to talk to this group of friends that I was hanging out with over here. And all of a sudden, I hear a girl yell out, one of the, the, the girls that was, were with us, hey, don't touch me. So I turn around just in time to see my friend take his adult beverage he was consuming and break this bottle over the senior guy's head. And he split open like a ripe pumpkin. I mean, just, and blood is coming down everywhere. And then a bit of a mob mentality broke out and everyone kind of jumped in and started pushing and shoving and, this senior guy, by the grace of God, finally can't see anything. He's kind of doing one of these. He just dives and dives into the car. And his buddy runs around and hops in the car. And they screech out of there. And if you know Sweetwater Park, uh, the parking lot opens up, but there's one little narrow runway that runs out to the street. And right in that narrow runway, the car stops. And the kid that wasn't cut up gets out of the car, screams a few expletives at me and my friends, and then says, you're all dead gets in his car, takes off. Well, all my friends panic. Oh, what did we just do? We're in so much trouble. We just upset the entire senior class at Horizon High School. We're now marked men. So they all get in their cars and scatter. And I don't know what it was. I don't know what was inside of me that night, but I decided I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to make this right because I'm friends with a lot of the senior class. I played football with a lot of them. And so I knew them really well. And I felt like I had a lot of good friends in there. So I'm going to stick around and try and make peace, make this right. So it's just me. I'm standing under a street light at Sweetwater Park at about 8 o'clock on a Friday night. About 10, 15 minutes go by, and I start to think, maybe no one's going to come. So just as I'm getting ready to hop in my nice little 1991 Honda Civic and go find the rest of my friends that night, uh, I see this line of cars coming down Sweetwater. And I mean, it looks like a Trump rally just let out. There's just cars after cars, and the music is cranked, and there's people yelling and screaming, and I think, oh, I wonder where they're going. 
And sure enough, one by one, they begin to make the right turn into Sweetwater Park. And somewhere in God's sovereign grace, the first group of cars that pull into the parking lot, for whatever reason, they stopped about 30 yards away from me and caused a huge backup. And so no one else could really get in and get close. But they all just kind of scattered their cars everywhere. And they all start getting out. And there must be 40 of them all coming out. And some of them I recognize. One of my really good friends that I played football with the, the whole season, I see him, he's coming right at me. I'm like, hey, kind of smile and give him one of these. And man, he wants me dead. And I begin to realize in this moment, I'm in real trouble. Because whatever relationship, whatever influence, whatever control I thought I had over some of my senior friends, I now realize uh, the kid that got cut up his influence and power and control was far greater than mine, and I'm in serious trouble. And it was like an old Western movie. They're just slowly walking towards me down the street, okay? And they just keep coming, and the mass keeps assembling. They keep coming out of cars. They had glass bottles. I, one guy, I thought he had a pipe. I thought it was a pipe. I found out later it was a golf club, of all things. But man, it looked like a pipe to me as a scared little 17-year-old. And here they come. They're getting closer and closer. They're about... 20 yards away, and the mass continues to build, uh, and I start to run through my options. All right, what do I do? Well, I could run, um, but I quickly thought about that. I'm like a cheetah. I'm good for about 10 yards, and then (laughs) after that, I tire quickly, okay? This body is not meant for long distance, so I knew that wasn't an option. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe if I just curl up in a ball, and it won't hurt as bad, but then again, thinking of that lead pipe that I thought was a lead pipe, that's going to hurt no matter what position you're in. Uh, and so they're about 10 yards away now. And I'm st- I can't back up. There's nowhere else to go. And I think, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick one. I'm going to pick one of these 40 kids. And at least he's going to know he was in a fight. Right? And so I'm kind of eyeing up, sizing up. Where's, who's the biggest one? Who could I miss? I can get one punch in. Who am I going to take it on? And so I identify my target. And he starts coming. And they're all coming at me. They're about five yards away. And then from out of nowhere, this girl off in the distance just screams out, get him. And I thought, okay, that's my moment. And so I go to make my move, my one move that I only have to make. And then that's intimate death for me. And as soon as I go to make it, whap, this gigantic hand comes down and wraps around the back of my neck and just grabs me to where I can't even move. And this voice yells out, no one's going to touch this kid. And immediately, as soon as he spoke, I knew who it was. It was my friend, Brandon. Brandon was the offensive tackle that played opposite me on the offensive line all throughout my junior year and my sophomore year of high school. He was my friend. He had power. He had control and he had influence over this group of students. It was like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Every single one of them stopped right where they were at and they just froze. And I remember looking up at him, scared to death, And he looked down at me and he just whispered these words to me. He said, I got you. I got you. And in that moment, it was like a sense of peace just came over me. Like, okay, my friend is here. He's got me. Everything's going to be all right. I share that story with you to, to try and make this huge leap, this big jump. What God is calling his children to do, what God is calling his church to do, what God's calling us to do as individuals, especially in light of this Love One campaign, for some of us is going to be terribly scary. It's going to be terrifying. It's going to come with a lot of anxiety, a lot of angst. And we're going to sit there and maybe be frozen in the moment of fear and not want to take a step of faith. And all I want you to do is I just want you to envision the all-powerful God of the universe with absolute control, influence, and power with his hand around your neck in a loving, encouraging way, looking down at you saying, I got you. I got you. We can do this. We can do this. So we're going to dive into our time in the word in just a second. Let me pray for us before we go to the text. And then let's see what God's going to do with God's church this morning. So let me pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, thank you that you love us, that you encourage us, that you are a good, good father. And so, God, now I thank you for this precious gift you've given us in your word. God, I pray that we would handle it correctly. I pray that you would do what only you can do, and that is speak to our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray for those in this room like myself that are going to hear this challenge and, God, maybe be a little intimidated or scared, God, that we would know that the God of the universe, the Almighty, has got his arm around us, and you walk hand in step with us. And so, God, for that, we thank you. We thank you, and we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. We love you, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
So we're going to be uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at just five verses. Uh, and man, these are five incredibly encouraging verses, at least to me and have been to me for a long time. In fact, for every student uh, that's ever had the privilege of sharing their testimony in any of the ministries that I've overseen, uh, for any of the interns that I've trained up that have gotten up front to teach or to preach, uh, and most of the time, anytime I'm sitting down right up over here at Shea, right down over here, uh, waiting for my opportunity to get up and teach the word, I go to this passage. Uh, Because to me, it's very encouraging, it's very uplifting, and it's very... Uh, comforting to know, okay, it's not about me. God, this is all about you, and what are you going to do? And so this is the Apostle Paul writing. Apostle Paul wrote more books in the New Testament than any other author. He, he fought with people all the time for the gospel. He'd walk into synagogues full of the Jewish people that hated Christ, and he would preach Jesus, and he'd get thrown out, sometimes thrown out of cities. He'd stood up to the riots in Ephesus. He was the one that would write in Romans, I am unashamed of the gospel. That's who's writing these words to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5. And it says this. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We're going to go through, we're going to break this down in just a second, but for all of you that are note takers, you'll notice there's no outline, there's just blank notes there. So let me give you your points today so you can feel good about yourself and take a deep breath and know that we can move on uh, with the rest of the morning. Here's what I think Paul's getting at. Here's what I think God longs for his church, what he wants for us as as his children. Uh, The first thing is this, preach Jesus. I want the simplicity of that uh, uh, underwhelm you, but we need to preach Jesus. We're going to hear why that's such an important thing in just a second. Preach Jesus. Number two, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Preach Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing is this. Let God do what God's going to do. We make it about us far too often. We'll talk about that in just a second. Preach Jesus. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let God do what God's going to do. And to me, if we hear nothing else today, if we just get that, man, what that might look like as God's children, go out from this place and go out and brag on Jesus to the world out there, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then we leave the results to God. Man, what an opportunity. What a great thing for God to rally his church around. Preach Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let God do what God's going to do. Let's go back and look at this. He says this in, in verse one, and I, when I came to you, brothers... I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony or the mystery of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You hear what Paul's saying here? He's saying, look, when I came to talk to you guys, I didn't have everything figured out. I didn't come with some some great oration of, of everything and the testimony and mystery of God. I showed up and I did one thing. I preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. Keep it simple. Stay on point. Rustin talked last week about this culture that's maybe a little more averse to the things of God right now. Uh, and they want to maybe more engage in a debate or, or an argument or, or attack us in certain things. And, and it's so easy to get sidetracked, so easy to get distracted, so easy to get pulled off in different directions. What would it look like if we just stayed on point and preached Jesus? Preach Jesus. Any opportunity we got. In its simplest forms. Again, Paul says, I didn't come with wise or persuasive speech. I just came and preached Jesus. So what does that look like? We're going to walk through what the gospel looks like in just a moment. In its simplest form. Uh, And my hope would be two things. One, if you know Jesus Christ in here, if if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, that, that you would hear this and you might feel a little more encouraged or at least with the ability to say, okay, at least I I know the Uh, the simplicity of the gospel to give you the confidence to go out and share it. But maybe there's some of you here and at Shea and at Cactus and the different venues, maybe you're here uh, and you're here at church and you don't even know why you're at church today. But you, you sit here and you look around this room. We just got done singing songs about some guy named Jesus and we're talking about Jesus and, and you realize you have no relationship with the, the God of the universe. 
And there's an, there's an angst in your soul, a longing in your soul for something more. And maybe it, it comes, this angst comes and it builds with some guilt and some shame over the things that you've done in your past. And even now, as you look around the room, you, 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 you get full of anxiety thinking, well, if anybody knew my past, would they reject me? Would they not accept me? And all of that is because, man, you haven't fully embraced the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, your Father. And so as I, as I share with you this gospel message, here's my challenge to you guys, if you're there. If God's moving, if the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, uh, listen to this. Listen to this, this beautiful message in its simplest form and maybe begin to wrestle with what does God have you here for this morning? So here we go. If you've been around, Jamie's given us four words. Four words that help us remember the gospel. I'm gonna give them to you and then we're gonna unpack them. Uh, the four words are this. It's God sin, Christ, and you. God, sin, Christ, and you. Here's what that looks like. The God of the universe, the one that made everything that you see around us, the one that is eternal, ruling and reigning for all time and past and the present and in the future, uh, he loves you. He loves us. We're the crescendo of his creation. He made man in his image and he looks down at mankind and he goes, man, I love you guys. I love you. I made you, I created you, and I want to walk hand in step with you. I love you so much. But we've got to own our part. We're sinners. We've fallen short. We haven't quite lived up to God's standard of perfection. You can call it a mistake. You can call it things in your past you're not proud of. You can call it whatever you want to call it. The Bible calls it sin. It's anything that we do that falls short of God's standard of perfection. And because of that, big problem is created. There's a separation between us, God's beloved, and our God because of our sin. And so God realizes this problem. Man, I love you so much, but but you have sin in your life and you can't clean it up yourself. So I'm gonna do something about it. And so the God of the universe comes down to earth in the form of a human being named Jesus Christ. He is the only person that's ever breathed air on this planet to live a sinless life. And at the end of his life, he finds himself in a garden with the decision to make. God, I don't want to do this, but if it's the only way, then let's, let's do it. God says it is, and so at the end of that night, he'd be led away and they would nail him to a cross where he would die a sinner's death for me and for you. And three days later, he would come back to life. He would beat death, celebrate that at Easter. And he's now seated at the right hand of God, looking down at his beloved children. And he loves us and he's interceding for us and he's doing all sorts of incredible things for his kids That's the gospel message, but at some point, here comes the you. You've got to make your choice. You've got to decide, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that gospel message? What are you going to do with God's love and your sin and Jesus Christ? Coming to church, that's not the answer. Sitting in Bible studies, that's not the answer. God's not going to ask you when you kneel before the throne of God one day, how many Bible studies did you attend? He's going to ask you one thing. What did you do with my son, Jesus? What did you do with my son, Jesus? See, that's what matters. That's what matters most. And so if you're here today, if you're in one of the venues on the other campuses and and you are sitting there going, man, I long for this relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never experienced that before. We're gonna give you an opportunity to respond at the end of today. to have a chance to come forward, talk to some pastors about what that looks like. But for all of us, all of us as children of God, as sons and daughters of God, preach Jesus in its simplest form. God loves you. We're all sinners. Christ died for us. You have the opportunity to put your faith in Jesus Christ. To me, that's what Paul's getting at here. Look, I didn't come with wise or persuasive words. I didn't. I came in and I I claimed to know one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. But then he would go on to say this. Look at verses three and four. Okay, this is encouraging for a guy like me. He says, and I was with you and in weakness and in fear and much trembling. This is the Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy's a hero of the faith. I, hear, I think of the Apostle Paul as just, I mean, he was a short dude, but just a short little tough dude, Napoleon complex, walking into anywhere, be like, I'm gonna tell you about Jesus. Full of confidence and bravado and ready to go. And here he's saying, no, man, I'm terrified. 
I'm scared. With, it was with weakness and in fear and much trembling. Guys, this should encourage some of us introverts like myself. The moment is going to come where God is going to call you to step out in faith and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you are going to be scared to death. Scared to death. Weakness, fear, trembling. So then the question is, what are we going to do with that? Because look at what Paul does. He says, I was scared. Verse four, in my speech and my message, they were not in plausible words of wisdom. No, they were in demonstration of the spirit and of power. See, here's what I think Paul's getting at here. And here's, we're gonna tie that opening story in. Paul's terrified. I was scared, full of fear, weakness, trembling. But I didn't let that fear make me a slave. Was not a slave to fear. Though I was scared, though I was terrified, I felt a giant hand wrap itself around my neck and I looked up and the God of the universe was looking down at me saying, Paul, I got you. Step out in faith. Go out and brag on my son, Jesus. And that moment he did and he changed the world. So guys, here's the opportunity before us. We've been asking you to think and to pray and to consider who this loved one is in your life. Who's God put in your world that he's asking you to be intentional with, relational with. And guys, are at some point, if we really begin to pray and get after it, like we're gonna do tonight, God's gonna give you the opportunity to share the gospel, to present Jesus. And I can tell you, for a lot of you, you're a lot like me, that moment's gonna come and the enemy's gonna get in your ear and you're gonna be afraid, you're gonna be weak, some of you might even be trembling. And you're gonna wanna do everything that you can to turn and run. But like a scared 17-year-old in the parking lot, I need you to envision the God of the universe putting his arm around you, looking down at you saying, I got you. Would you step out in faith? Would you step out in trust? And would you not be a slave to fear? But move past that. Paul says, look, my my message isn't wise or persuasive, not with plausible words. Some of you are gonna sit there and go, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. That's the beauty of it. Brag on Jesus. If you know Jesus Christ, just brag on Jesus. That's what he's asking you to do. Here's what has happened, at least from my experience, and it's happened a number of times. This opportunity comes, and I've told you times before, guys, I'll be honest with you. Opportunities have come before, and I have cowered. I have allowed my fear and my trembling to take over, and I have completely missed that opportunity. I've shared that story before a couple times. But there's been other times where I've said, all right, God, you got me, let's do this. And I step out, and I utter some words, and I don't even know what I'm saying, and the next 10 minutes goes by like a blur, And all of a sudden, I see the person leaning in and they're asking me questions and I'm quoting scripture. I didn't even know I knew all over the place. And they're asking me questions. I'm like, oh, that's because Paul says, I'm doing all this stuff. And by the end of it, they're going, wow, that was great. And I go, I don't know what I just said. I don't know what I just did. And I get in my car and I drive away from the lunch or the breakfast, whatever it was. And I just go, God, I don't know what you just did, but thank you for showing up. Thank you for doing what you promised you would do and not making it about me. Preach Jesus, brag on Jesus. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The God of the universe has got his hand around your neck saying, I got you, let's do this. You're gonna be afraid. There's gonna be trembling. You're gonna be weak. You're not gonna know what to say. You can brag on Jesus. God send Christ in you and go out and share the hope of Jesus Christ. Paul says, look, I was afraid. Don't let the fear of rejection control you. He says he's not eloquent. Don't let the fear of, what if I don't know what to say? What if I don't answer the right question? Don't let any of that sway you. God's got you. God's got you. Now, here's why this is so important. And here's what I need all of us to understand. This is not, this has not been a love one campaign, a love one teaching time, a love one series uh, to have you guys bring your friends to church. It's not what this is about. This is not a bring your friends to church series. This is an empowering God's church, God's children, God's sons and daughters to go out and to brag on Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it. If you wanna use church as an opportunity to start the conversation and this place is a tool for you, that's great. But, but please hear me on this. This is not, hey, love one, love some people, bring them to church and then go, all right, Jamie, I got them here. I did my part, it's all up to you now. Let's see what happens. No, this is our opportunity to step into their world. Instead of waiting for the lost world to show up at, in our world, this is an intimidating place for a lot of people outside of here. 
It is. It's great for us because we're a family. We get it. But it's intimidating for some. They may never darken these doors. But you know where they are? They're at your place of work. They're at your kid's baseball game this weekend. They're at your kid's school. They're at your gym. They're at your doctor's office. Or wherever you are, wherever you are at, whatever that picture and that name is God's put in, in your mind, they're in your world. God wants you to be intentional, be relational, and take that step of faith at some point. You might be afraid, but step out knowing that God has got you and share Jesus Christ. Paul wraps it up with this statement here in verse five. This one I think is a a little encouraging and condemning for me at the same time. He says, I didn't come with wise or persuasive words, came in the power of the spirit. Why? Verse five, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Here's what I think Paul is saying there. He's saying, guys, it's not about me. It's all about God. It's not about me. It's all about God. And yet, how often do we make it all about us? What if I don't know the right thing to say? What if I get rejected? What if I, what if I, what if I? And God's up there going, look, go brag on my son Jesus in the power of my Holy Spirit, and then I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I've fallen victim to this countless times. I've made this statement before and and now it it sickens me that that I've ever said it. But maybe some of you guys have been in the same boat where you you had the opportunity to see somebody come to Christ and your statement is, hey, I just led so-and-so to the Lord. No, you didn't. You bragged on Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and God did all the work. It's not about us. Let's stop making it about us. Let's stop working ourselves up like, I gotta do everything right. No, you don't. God's going to do what God's going to do. Guys, I've watched people give the gospel and gone, man, you butchered that. That was awful. And people in droves go, I need Jesus. And then I've given up. And I've, man, I've, spelled, I've got it all beautifully laid out in illustrations and stories and presenting the gospel. And people are in tears. And I go, all right, who wants to respond to Christ? And it's crickets. <laughs> Why? Because I made it all about me. Because I made it all about me. I came with wise and persuasive words, with wisdom. God said, Kevin, that's not what it's about. It's not about you. It's never been about you. It's all about my son, Jesus, and you being empowered by the Holy Spirit so that I can do what only I can do. And guys, I don't say that to diminish our role. I don't say it to, to make us feel small. I say it to take some pressure off of you. Take a deep breath. Here's what God's asking you to do. Go brag on his son. That's it. If they reject Jesus or accept Jesus, you didn't have anything to do with either one of those. God does. So can we trust him? Can we look up at the all-powerful God of the universe with his hand around our neck saying, I got you. Would you walk out and step out in faith and encourage and go do what I'm asking you to do? What would it look like for us to go do that? To do that as a church. Guys, that's a big reason why tonight it's important for you guys to come back as the family of God, certainly here at Northridge, at Shea and at Cactus, that you would rally. The family of God's gonna rally tonight from five to six and we're gonna pray. We're gonna invite the Holy Spirit to cause revival in our community. We're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to use us to impact the world around us. We're gonna pray that God gives us an opportunity to share the hope of Jesus Christ with a hurting world. And I'm telling you right now, you give me a church united around that, casting that vision before the Lord, there's no limit to what God can do. What God can do in the lives of our loved ones and the people he's put on our heart. So come back tonight. Let's be a family. Let's rally together. Let's pray for each other as we do that. Here's what we're going to do in our our last few minutes together. We're going to give you guys an opportunity to do something that Jamie alluded to and Rustin talked about last week. It's a it's a phrase that we've, we've kind of come to say quite a bit around here. It's this idea of walking across the room. That you would walk across the room. That's kind of what we're asking you to do, that you would identify someone, that you would love them, and that you would walk across the room and begin a relationship with them. And then at some point, that you would share the gospel message with them. And so we've been asking you for the last couple of weeks to begin to pray and think about who is it God's put in your path? Who is it God's put in your life to love right where they're at? They're in your world they're not in mine, they're not in Jamie's, they're not in Rustin's, they're in your world. So these are the ones God's put in your life to impact. And so we've asked you to begin to think and to pray about that. And so here's what we're gonna do at all the different 
venues. We're going to have some ushers standing around in the, in the room. Uh, they've got baskets or, or tables or whatever it is at your venue. Uh, and they've got cards. And what we're going to ask you to do, spend some time praying about the person God's put on your heart. And then you're going to get up and you're going to walk across the room, symbolic, get a card, bring it back to your seat. You're just going to write the name of the person you're praying for on it. And then you're going to take that with you. You, you know, our, Again, my hope is, put it in the dashboard of your car so you see it every day and you're reminded to pray and to be intentional, to be relational, and to step out in faith and encourage, share the gospel with that individual. And wherever you're going to see it all the time, we want you to take those and, and keep those and keep it in front of your mind uh, because it's going to be awesome to see what God's going to do in these next couple of months with God's church and God's family united together around this cause. Uh, there might be others of you uh, that are sitting there saying, man, I long for this Jesus that you talk about and you want to accept Christ or you want to begin to take some steps in your faith to do that. As everyone else is getting up to go get the cards, uh, I would encourage you to come forward. At our different venues, there's going to be some pastors up front. They would love to talk with you, encourage you, pray with you, answer any questions you might have. Um, but if you're in that space, and you're sitting there going, man, I, I need this Jesus you keep talking about. Walk up front, talk to somebody up front. They would love to have that opportunity to do that. Uh, be intentional, be relational, go brag on Jesus. Come back tonight as a family, we'll pray together. Uh, well, I'm gonna pray right now uh, for us this morning and for everyone uh, that's, that's listening right now. God, we thank you so much. For your gospel message. God, I thank you for the hope of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you as a, as a terrified son of yours. God, with weakness and in fear and much trembling, God, that I can look up and know that you have got your arm around me, that you walk hand in step with me. God, I pray I would never run before you and I would never lag behind, but God, I would walk and step with your spirit. God, I pray the same for my brothers and sisters here. God, you're about to send us out into a world that desperately needs your son, Jesus Christ. So God, I pray you'd give us compassion, you'd give us courage, you'd give us conviction as we walk out to live out our faith, to love those you put in our path, and to brag on your son, Jesus Christ. So God, we'll thank you in advance for what you're gonna do, because it is all about you, it's not about us. Well, thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. And God, thank you for letting us be a part of it. We love you, we thank you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.